Have you ever wanted to go to space, but on the cheap? We hear about people going to space today. It's not impossible to go to space. We've been there, done that. That's an old milestone. But what if you could send things to space at an affordable price, spending less than $25,000 per kilogram to get something up into Earth's orbit? Does that sound like a, an interesting prospect to you? Maybe if you could pay, say, 300 pounds and you get a trip to space. I mean, if someone came up to me and offered me uh, a trip to space in exchange for 300 quid, I would uh, be I would feel compelled to take their offer very seriously. It's very tempting. Do you have a device that <laughs> allows me to do that? Uh, I'm afraid not, and no one does. <laughs> but the concept of a space elevator could bring us that reality one day, maybe. So today we're talking about space elevators, as you might have realized. And a space elevator is basically something that connects the surface of the Earth to, to space outside of the Earth's atmosphere in geostationary orbit or beyond. And the concept of this is such that you could in effect, move things into space without having to spend a fortune and a load of energy trying to shoot everything out into space. If you had, say, a cable that was running from the surface of the Earth into space, you could run things up that cable into space and it would be much easier to do so. And when it's easier, it's cheaper. And when it's cheaper, you can do it more. And you can do loads more stuff in space. You might even be able to launch things into space because you can just drag them up and then launch them when they're outside the atmosphere. <laughs> what do you think about space elevators? Well, it's it's very exciting how how close we are for them being a, a reality, really. For a, for a concept that was introduced in the 19th century by uh, a Russian scientist called Konstantin uh, Tsiolkovsky. It's a remarkably modern feeling idea. It's like something out of science fiction. You know, you literally get onto an elevator, not as you would normally understand an elevator perhaps, but in essence you'd get onto an elevator and take a trip up to geostationary orbit in space. How like and, and to have a to have a to have a structure to have to have one long cable that, that, that connects those two points beginning and end would be such an incredible achievement and it would look it would just look sci-fi in the skyline <laughs> I'm struggling to contain my excitement like you know we've, we've spoken about the International Space Station before and how uh, how cool, so not the International Space Station the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope although the uh, International Space Station is also very cool and exciting but we've spoken about the Hubble Space Telescope before and how uh, how how awesome that is in various aspects, but it's not visible to us normally. I mean, you can track where it is above the planet and on a clear night or day, try and spot it, and that has been done. But in general, it's up there, it's doing its job, it's doing its thing, uh, but we don't really notice it day to day. We only see the pictures that it beams down. But a space elevator is something that you would physically see going up from the horizon into the sky beyond our line of sight and you know that the other end is held in outer space somewhere i, I mean just the, the 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 physical dimensions of it are a big part of why i'm very excited to talk about it it was a bit rambly i'm afraid but it's it's try i'm struggling to convey <laughs> my excitement <laughs> well even the idea that the Russian scientist Konstantin came up with was inspired by the Eiffel Tower <laughs> because I presume he saw it, saw a big, a huge structure and thought, that's pretty cool. Imagine if we built one that was 35,786 kilometers tall. And you have to respect that. Uh, then, yeah, well, you could put things into space from there. Um, so that would that concept is 
now described as a compression structure, that idea of a space elevator. And that means that you've built, basically when you build a building upwards, you need the building to be able to withstand the weight uh, at every point below. Like if you're just building a tower block, you need the base of the tower block to be strong enough to support the weight of the top. But modern concepts for the space elevator call for a tether or a tensile structure. So the idea is that you have a really long cable and actually, rather than having to support the weight of a very, very tall tower, you have a cable that has to be able to withstand being pulled apart because you place an object outside of the Earth's like geostationary orbit zone, and that object is constantly flying away from Earth and pulling on the tether. <laughs> Um, and that creates a nice straight cable right from the surface of the Earth into space. And the space elevator is maybe the most famous of um, uh, of, of concepts for space launch that don't involve the use of rockets, right? But there are actually several, uh, like at least a dozen other um, proposals for how we might achieve uh, non-rocket space uh, space launch um, because there are lots of problems with using rockets aren't there I mean they uh, <laughs> I mean for their environmental concerns um, both for the kind of in atmosphere planet uh, you know you're using a lot of fuel um, and there's a lot of relative pollution to, to launch rockets into space and then you have space pollution itself. Uh, especially if the rockets are not reusable and parts detach during launch and end up whizzing around the Earth at um, uh, extremely high speeds. You can damage things that are following similar orbits, um, like bullets whizzing. And if this happens enough, well, over time, the debris will just keep orbiting and the debris will build up as the rocket launches become ever more common. Um, you also need a lot of time um, and a lot of energy for um, rocket launch cycles. They're also very weather dependent and the list goes on and on. So this idea of non-rocket space launch of which the space elevator is kind of king amongst them uh, attempts to circumvent these problems in, in various ways. Um, are you aware of any other non-rocket space launch uh, concepts beyond space elevators? I am not. Do you care well, to enlighten me? <laughs> um, there, I, I was looking this up. There's, it's an article, uh, a separate article called Non Rocket Space Launch, and I was just browsing the names. Some of them are variations on the space elevator, so um, uh, you have like hypersonic sky hooks, which is a kind of momentum exchange tether uh, or non-rotating skyhook um, but then you have things like the uh, the slingatron uh, which says it's uh, a system whereby projectiles are accelerated along a rigid tube or track that typically has circular or spiral turns um, by accelerating a projectile in a curved tube um, by propelling the entire tube um, in a circular motion of constant or increasing frequency without changing its orientation. Um, you can launch things into space this way. And uh, I just feel like this is a concept that could could be going places in the next 50 years or so, you know? So, tell us then, why don't we have a space elevator yet? What's stopping <laughs> us? Um, our materials aren't good enough yet. They will be <laughs> soon. Uh, but we, uh, when the concept was first proposed, nothing that we knew of could withstand uh, the forces that would be stressed upon a, a space elevator. Because again, it's a physical, one physical object, one cable that runs from the, the, the surface of the Earth all the way up into space. 
um, and so it's got to have a lot of stresses on it and nothing uh, available at the time I think even things like diamond aren't suitable for uh, a construct of that scale um, we do have uh, materials that could make space elevators in orbital bodies uh, that are uh, that have weaker gravity, so like the Moon or Mars. Um, materials like uh, modern-day Kevlar are probably strong enough for space elevators from one of those bodies, but for the Earth with its slightly stronger gravitational pull, um, the best bet is normally cited as carbon nanotubes. Uh, but the difficulty with carbon nanotubes is that we haven't been able to make anything long enough without accumulating flaws in the molecular structure of the tubes um, that would compound themselves at scale and and lead to collapse and, and failure. Um, I think the longest nanotube we've been able to make uh, either flawlessly or, or uh, almost a, enough flawlessly is only about a meter long I think and that's not long enough to reach outer space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the longest perfect carbon nanotube is not mm -hmm. longer than a meter. And we probably want a perfect one so it doesn't snap in the imperfect <laughs> place. Yeah. Um, here's a question for you. Why don't we see more space elevators in science fiction? Because although... I said it sounds like something out of science fiction. I can't actually recall many examples, especially visual examples in film or, or TV, of space elevators being used. Do you think it would look? Do you think it would look ridiculous <laughs> if you saw in the background in the skybox a black straight line that just goes up into the sky out of sight? Do you think there'd be like a problem with your television? Uh, I think there are, I mean, if it's science fiction, there are ways you can depict it that could make it look cool. I think the conflict is that it's hard to, I would think it could be difficult to envision one that looks very cool and looks realistic, because I'm not sure how thick this proposed uh, space elevator cable would have to be but it goes very very high up so how much of it would you actually be able to see at a distance I don't know but in terms of why isn't it in fiction more I mean you could certainly conceive of just just imagine a cable very thick or a huge tower all the way into space that could look pretty cool um, and I don't know why it's not in more stuff. It, it, I imagine it's in more than is mentioned on the Wikipedia page in terms of like, so I'll mention what's on the Wikipedia page, but it's also in, uh, I've seen it pop up in video games. Like, I don't know if you've heard of the game Satisfactory. Uh, I haven't. Which is, it, it's a sort of a sandboxy automation focused game where you are on an alien planet and you are building like a factory and part of that process of developing a large space factory is building a space elevator where you can send goods off world in exchange for some perks and some milestones with the company that you work for canonically um, and that looks pretty cool in that game, but that's the only time I think I can recall seeing it in a form of fiction myself. So the Wikipedia page talks about the introduction to space elevators in the novel The Fountains of Paradise. So the idea was that they there was a space elevator built on top of a mountain um, and also it's mentioned in a novel The Web Between Worlds there's a space elevator the novel Friday there is a mention 
of a sky hook and a the concept of a beanstalk used I presume to get into space. Yeah, there's a few mentions, but there doesn't seem to be anything in the really well-known pop science fiction. Mm. I mean, I, I the, well, the one thing I can think of is um, there are a couple of space elevators in, in uh, the Halo series of video games um, where they're used as uh, backdrops. Um, uh, like the a couple of the games that take place in New Mombasa in a, f- a future Africa, and there are uh, space tethers and things in, in there, but they're never really used for mm. very much. Except, I think there's a scene where one gets severed <laughs> and collapses, and that's perhaps what would be on my mind if I were potentially going up into space. Like, for some reason, I'm I'm more sc- I would be more scared of going up in an elevator than I would be in a rocket which perhaps sounds a bit strange because the rocket is a single vehicle that's packed full of uh, explosive fluid Um, whereas a space elevator is pretty stable under gravitational effects in theory but I just couldn't get it out of my head that like someone could come along (laughs) with a big hammer (laughs) Or an enormous pair of scissors and just snap the space elevator and collapse the whole thing like a um, like a telephone uh, pole. Yeah, well, I would imagine part of the anxiety, if you were to be on a space elevator, could be if it takes as long as some of the proposals that have come about in the last decade, it could take you about a week of traveling up the elevator to actually get into space so even though the rocket is dangerous it might be it might have a little psychological trick that because it's over fairly quickly Mm. you don't you don't feel as anxious you don't have time for it to fester that's true and actually on that note that's something that surprised me when i was reading about space elevators is how slow they are um all the estimates say, yeah, but kind of, um, set, you know, taking several days to get all the way into orbit from the ground, and it makes sense, I suppose, when you think about it. But I've never entertained the idea of spending, you know, going camping in an elevator <laughs> that's constantly getting higher and higher, um, like a really, really slow burn roller coaster. Yeah, it, it really does make sense how long it will take, though. Yeah, if you have a look at any of the attempts to graphically depict a space elevator, which w- will include one in the YouTube video, but getting to geostationary orbit, it's quite a big distance away from the surface of the Earth. <laughs> so, yeah, got a long ways to go. Um, apart from getting things up into orbit uh, one of the other uses of a space elevator that I hadn't considered is launching things into deeper space uh, beyond just the Earth's immediate orbit Um, if you consider that the uh, because of the length of the cable the uh, the, the radius of the space elevator with respect to the Earth um, is in the tens of thousands of, of kilometers um, to reach escape velocity. Um, and so if under some designs, if you had a cable that was almost 90,000 miles long, which is uh, about 145-ish thousand kilometers, um, then your tangential velocity at the end is about 11 kilometers or uh, per second or seven miles a second which is more than enough escape uh, escape velocity to get rid of uh, earth's gravitational field and you could la- use this to launch probes from the surface directly out into deep space to places like jupiter um, where you could then do gravi- uh, gravitational slingshotting to increase your speed further and escape the solar system and go into deep space so when people say that it makes things cheaper 
for things to leave the earth it doesn't just refer to for example constructing large space projects larger elevators or ships or habitat modules or things in orbit but it also refers to uh, literally blasting things off into deep space through the use of an elevator yeah pretty cool uh, i've always liked the idea of the the gravitational sling that's something that comes up a lot in in uh, science fiction mm. other such space related films mm. because i mean it's something that we actually use that yeah i don't know what else to say about it really well, it's a cool idea it is but i've just discovered that there is an entirely separate article called space elevator safety <laughs> Um, so it seems that my my reservations and fears are not unfounded. Um, I mean, to be clear, I'm sure it can all be dealt with, uh, but I, I like the idea that there's a separate article just discussing how dangerous it is to actually use a space elevator. So here are the here are the risks that uh, that Wikipedia thinks are associated with space elevators. Um, if uh, nothing were done. Essentially, all satellites uh, with peregrines below the top of the elevator would necessarily collide with it eventually. Um, it says that if uh, in the in the event that it fails due to perhaps corrosion, um, depending on what you use to build the tether, and um, you have to consider how the chemistry of erosion changes as you increase your altitude, so in the upper atmosphere you have uh, atomic oxygen that will corrode most things, even if slowly over time. Um, or uh, some other unforeseen or even foreseen accident or failure point. Um, if the elevator is cut at its anchor point on the Earth's surface, then the outward force exerted by the counterweight would cause the entire elevator to rise upward into a higher orbit or escape Earth's velocity altogether, which I think is really cool. <laughs> Would you like to see that on television? Like like a balloon floating away. Someone sabotages the elevator with a big axe. Wham! They cut the tether, and instead of the whole thing collapsing on the surface, the whole thing just flies away into heaven. Yeah, I, I can imagine that. <laughs> some <laughs> okay. With some some unexpected unexpected observers <laughs> yeah. on their way up the elevator, witnessing Earth start to disappear much quicker. <laughs> oh, we've really increased the speed, these guys. Uh, yeah, it's a one-way ticket. Um, okay, that that would look ridiculous on television, though, right? Like, um, like watching an enormous metal or or carbon you know nano structure float up into the sky it would look like you've just photoshopped it in you know or cgi'd it in it's very interesting um well i wouldn't put it past plenty of good sci-fi has historically mm. looked a bit ridiculous <laughs> mm. well if you cut the elevator not at the earth anchor point but rather uh higher up at about 25,000 kilometers or 16,000 miles then everything below the severance point would collapse and descend to earth as you would expect um, and damage everything <laughs> around it whereas anything above the severance point would uh, rise up into a higher orbit and then finally if the break occurred at the counterweight side of the elevator um, then the lower portion which is now the central station would begin to fall down um, into re-entry if no part of the cable below failed as well. But depending on the size, this would then either burn up on re-entry or would impact into the surface of the Earth. Um, a mechanism to immediately sever the cable below the station would prevent re-entry of the station and instead result in its continuation into a high and slightly modified orbit. And it says that simulations have shown that as the descending portion of the space elevator wraps around the Earth, the stress of the remaining length of cable increases, resulting in its upper sections breaking off and being flung away. Um, so even a question as intuitive as 
what happens if I cut it has at least three different answers depending on where you cut it and, and what uh, what safety things you have in place. Um, so I, I actually propose that the article on space elevator safety is almost as interesting as the article on the space elevator itself. Yeah, I was thinking with building something so large and revolutionary, you're going to have to expect to deal with a lot of things going wrong. But if the initial technology is so on the brink, so on the brink of what is technologically possible when it is built, it's going to be quite difficult to solve unforeseen problems. Mm. I mean, historically, we've had plenty of rockets go wrong or blow up or catch fire. But if the thing that goes wrong costs um, many, many billions of pounds to attempt one time, mm. I can imagine the costs in the event that stuff keeps going wrong becoming a bit a bit of a barrier. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what people would do. You know, what if your what if NASA <laughs> had started building one and then it turned out it was going to cost three times as much as the massive initial price. I mean, that just sounds like your average NASA project, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love NASA, but everything runs over budget all the time. It's kind of unavoidable. Yeah. Um, there's probably... I guess the, the, the purpose of this, though, is the, the investment, because you save so much money putting things in deep space if you actually get it working. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so... In the final couple of minutes, uh, let me let me pin you down for an opinion uh, and a prediction from your good self. What okay. did you, what do you think humanity will accomplish first? Do you think we will put uh, a human being on Mars first, or do you think we will uh, construct or begin construction? Begin construction. Of a space elevator first. I feel like begin construction is is kind of a a weird one because I could imagine construction on something like that technically beginning well before we actually have the technology to finish it. <laughs> but I would predict. So obviously, there <laughs> seem to be a number of delays in various space spacey individuals plans to put people on Mars but I do think that we'll probably put people on Mars before we have a space elevator just because I think we probably have the technology to put people on Mars it's just we're looking for we're looking for more than just putting people there mm. and then letting that be the end point we want to be able to put people there and have them survive there for a bit and to be able to bring them back. Whereas the space elevator, I think there's just so many unknowns in terms of like the, the, the number of aspects that I read about being like, oh yeah, this is fine. This will be possible once we've developed in engineering and in material science. <laughs> and, and basically it'll be possible once we can do things that are impossible. Okay. I just um, have, I just, your answer has inspired a second question because you seem to have made this assumption yeah. that the people we put on Mars will want to come back. How many, how, how much money do you think NASA or SpaceX or whoever gets there first will save by screening for people who don't want to return to Earth? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just, I don't know, I don't know whether it would be that good for their long-term financial goals if they <laughs> did a one-way project. <laughs> I don't know, I think they'd find some yeah. other people. Tempting. If I was to, pr if I was to give an optimistic, what I think is an optimistic guess as to when we would get a space elevator, if we get one, would be... You know, I think we'd be lucky to get one by 2100, honestly. I really don't see one coming soon. Because on, of something of this scale, it, it's pretty classic. I mean, even if we wanted to build a new rail line with available technology, <laughs> it's going to take a decade longer than planned. So a space elevator, you know, that's going to take 
that's going to take 50 years longer than, <laughs> yeah. than the nice estimate that people give. True. Closer, closer than you might first think, but not as close as putting a person on Mars. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have no idea if we're going to get one before we blow ourselves up anyway. Oh, that's true. Oh, final thought. If we have a space elevator, it unlocks a new way of burying people as well. You know, be cremated or, or wrap, wrap your body up in a suitable coffin and blast it off into deep space via space elevator. Yeah. Well, you never know. How long will it take before we have environmental rules on uh, dumping stuff into space? <laughs> One day, you know, when we're, when, we're, when we're thinking real long term, we're like, well, we might, we might need to expand into the rest of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, well, we shall see. Thanks for listening. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode, and we'll be back next time for another interesting topic.